Thank you, Emma. I want to offer my welcome as well as Emma's to any who are visiting this this morning, um, guests amongst us. Um, if you're unsure what's kind of going on at this point, um, for the next kind of 15, 20 minutes, we're going to just think about um, the Bible and what it means to us, what it says to us, and particularly as part of this series that we're working through life on the front line. But before we do that, and um, before we get to whatever we do and those sort of things, I want to begin by talking about a different word. I want to talk about the word just. The word just. I don't know what that might conjure up in your mind. It's, as with many words in the English language, there's a variety of meanings um, that it could, could use. I'll be honest, one of my first responses, and maybe it's yours as well, um, was it took to the romantic scene at the end of the film Notting Hill. Um, which maybe you may not be surprised with or not, I don't know. Um, but it's where Julia Roberts, if you've never seen it, Julia Roberts, who's playing this Hollywood actress, Anna Scott, uh, she's standing before this bookshop owner in Notting Hill, William Thacker, played by Hugh Grant, and she utters the phrase, I'm just a girl, standing in front of a boy, asking him to love. Now, to be fair, initially, he does turn her down, and in quite a dramatic fashion. Um, but not long after that, with the help of his friends, I mean, you always need good friends, he realises the enormity of his mistake, um, and ultimately there's a happy ending that follows. And my I add, en route, there's a glorious moment where William and his friends, they all pile into Bernie, one of William's friends, his Peugeot estate. Um, sadly, it's not a 1974 uh, Dodge sedan, but they race across London with Give Me Some Loving blaring uh, as the soundtrack. Um, and personally, I think that's one of the best moments in the film. But um, I digress. My point is, this word just, in that moment when Anna, the character in that film, says it to William, you know, I'm just a girl uh, asking, uh, standing in front of a boy, asking him to love her. Whether you like the film or you've seen it or not, whether you like the actors, actors, all that sort of stuff. I think in that moment, that word, just, is used in, in, a, in a beautiful, humble, and a romantic way. Um, it's trying to conjure up her honesty of where she's at, um, how much she loves him. Now, I wonder though, when we sometimes maybe think of that word, or maybe when we use that word, just, maybe of ourselves, do we use it in a much more negative way? And particularly when we think about our front lines and the lives we live on the whole kind of Monday through to Saturday, uh, Sundays as well. But you know, actually, is it a case of, well, you know, Lynn might just say, well, I'm just a piano teacher. Um, Janet might say, well, I'm just someone who cares for our mum and dad. Paul could say, well, I'm just someone sitting in a home office in my garden on a computer trying to connect with people all over the country and deal with various problems. You know, I'm only, I'm merely... I'm nothing but uh, I'm just. When we think about our front lines, the lives that we live, the places uh, that we go, the impact that I believe we can all have, um, and we, we turn to think about what it is that we do on the front line. That's what the, the children uh, were being encouraged to think about some of the things they might use and do, objects that remind them of their schools, whether they love them or not. Um, do we sometimes feel that we come up a bit short? Although actually our example, maybe what you wrote uh, on, on this map point, or what you would do if you hadn't done it the other week, but, but actually we think, well, it's nothing special really. I haven't really got much to offer. And certainly not compared to other people, um, even just hearing Lynn, um, Janet uh, and Paul, or the conversation we have, we think, actually, my front run, you know, I haven't really got much to, to shout about here. I've not got really anything worth in terms of what I do on my front run. You know, from the outset, whatever we do, the work of our hands, however small and insignificant it may seem, all of it matters to God. There isn't some big list somewhere um, where if you kind of hit a certain category, then you're in, but everything else is, well, maybe there's then a medium category, you could use that sort of thing, and then there's those that we don't even speak about because they're just useless. None of that. Everything matters to God. It's part of our worship. It's part of how we serve him throughout our lives. As LICC um, point out in their resources, LICC, uh, the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, um, and they have developed the resources that we base this 
series on in terms of living our lives as whole life disciples on our front lines. They say there can be significance in our daily tasks and activities, however great or small. You know, the American pastor, Mark Batterson, he says this. He says, it's not about what you do. It's about why you do what you do. Ultimately, it's about who you do it for. We're going to come back to that idea uh, and those words um, a bit later on. But first of all, I want us to turn to the Bible, and we're going to read from uh, some verses from Colossians, which is one of the letters in the New Testament. You'll see the words up on the screen. I'm going to read from Colossians 3, uh, verses 15 to 17, and then jump to 23 and 24. It says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then from verse 23. Whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So we have this guy, Paul, who's writing uh, this letter uh, that we call uh, Colossians. Um, He's writing to a group of believers, um, followers of Jesus, the church, um, they're in a place called Colossi, which is modern-day Turkey for us. Um, if you kind of typed in on Google, you know, I wanna, where's the first ha- closest flight to Colossi, you wouldn't actually get an answer, but you kind of head to Turkey, uh, and you're going to be in the right area. And the focus of the whole letter, Paul is describing to the kind of community that God was calling them to be. This whole letter is about different things, different issues, different challenges that they're facing of how they can be the very best community uh, of believers, of followers of Jesus. Now in these verses, you may have picked up, there's that repeated phrase, uh, whatever you do, firstly in verse 17, then again in verse 23, whatever you do. Is it a case that that Paul's just, you know, repeating himself um, because he can't think of anything else to say? I don't know if you ever do that, you write a letter or an email or, or that sort of thing, and you end up just kind of saying the same thing three times to pad it out. Um, because you've got a word count you've got to get to, and really it's the same thing you're saying a number of times. Is he trying to really emphasize the point? Is he really trying to ram this home? And that's why he's just repeating himself, uh, which is something that sometimes uh, is done. Paul is talking about something that we've already actually reflected on in this series. Um, For those who are visitors here today, um, it's the whole idea, as Emma's referenced, uh, of being gathered and scattered The whole idea that as church, um, as the family of God, we both gather, which on the whole is done on a Sunday um, for us. We gather on a Sunday, um, although we do it at other points in the week as well. But we gather and we come together. But we also scatter. And not as a, a negative idea, but actually out into the rest of our lives. Out to teach people piano. Out to look after uh, parents. Out to, you know, try and work through challenges and problems of call centre people all around uh, the country. We gather and we scatter. And it's the same focus that Paul is actually talking about here. Um, Initially, the whatever you do of verse 17 is as they gather. He's saying as you gather, as you meet, as they spend time together as church, as believers, followers of Jesus, whatever you do. And then he goes on in verse 23 saying again, you know, talking about the rest of their lives and all the other things you do as well. So it's not just about that moment when you come together as believers, but actually throughout the entirety of your life. Just as Jenny spoke about last year, thinking about the wherever that that might take us. So whatever you do, verse 17, do it all in the name of the Lord. And then in verse 23, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. You see, these words of Paul uh, are seeking to combat um, the concept that we can sometimes have, something known as the sacred-secular divide. 
That may be a phrase you've heard of before, maybe it's something completely new to you. Mark Green, the mission champion of LICC, he said this, the sacred secular divide is the pervasive belief that some things are really important to God and that other things aren't. Sacred, secular, it's the idea that there's some things that God's really interested in uh, and the rest of it, well, God's really not that bothered about. Mark Green goes on, he says, on the sacred side of the divide, there's church, there's prayer meetings, there's social action, there's world missions, there's singing outside uh, Tesco's and so on. Uh, we believe that these things are important to God and they are. He then goes on, he says, but other human activities are at best neutral. So work, school, college, sports, the arts, music, he says, unless it's got Christian words to it, then it's kind of okay. Um, leisure, sleep, rest, these sorts of things belong firmly on the secular side of life. The truth is, though, all of it matters to God. And if we've got in our heads um, that there is this line between the two, and actually we need to kind of filter our life and go, well, these things are important to God, but this stuff, well, it probably isn't. I haven't got to really worry about that. We need to readjust our thinking. Whatever we do can have a significance for God. I love the, the way Dr. Martin Luther King put it uh, half a century ago. He says, if it falls to your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep the streets. Like Michelangelo painted pictures, like Shakespeare wrote poetry, like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets so well that all the host of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well, you know, coming back to what Mark Batterson said, that, that American pastor, it's not about what you do, it's about why you do what you do. Ultimately, it's about who you do it for. You know, today is a great example of that, as we're going to celebrate in a, in a short while with Izzy and Janet as they uh, go through the waters of baptism. Because yeah, in part, we're going to actually, before they do that, we're going to hear something of their stories. Something of the journey, uh, of the experience they've had that has brought them and led them to this point today deciding uh, to do this. And part of their stories that actually kind of connect all the stories of anyone who has ever been baptized is a relationship with Jesus. A belief in God's story of redemption. You know, that we were created um, with a purpose. And that purpose was to know him. Yeah, that's where it all began, back in the Garden of Eden that we can read about in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. Now, God didn't create Adam and Eve. He doesn't create us as robots uh, who would just, there's that word again, just, you know, do what we're told. No, he gave us that free will because he wanted to have a relationship with us. He wanted to actually know his creation. With that comes the challenge, though of that choice. That's what free will is, isn't it? That choice, whether we choose to be in that relationship with God or not, whether we choose to live our own way or not. And when sin entered the world, human beings, uh, you know, we began our own path. One that actually said, well, we actually think we know better. Um, we actually think we know better than God. Uh, we, know, we know better than our creator. Um, and actually, we can think we can do a far superior job than our creator um, without him. Um, so we don't need you. So we'll just carry on and do our own thing. And so the relationship was broken. But God's love and his grace, we've been singing about it this morning, it was so vast that he wasn't going to leave it there. He wasn't going to say, okay, off with you. I don't want anything else to do with you. No. You know, the Bible speaks about the penalty for sin being death. But it also speaks about the truth of how God paid that price for us, sacrificing his son Jesus on a cross, that he would be there in our place, all so we could know God again. Making it possible for us to know that reality of a relationship with Jesus. Again, though, it comes down to that choice. That choice of whether we want to or how we want to respond. And it's a choice that only we can make for ourselves. And maybe that choice is a choice 
of saying actually, you know, that it describes to those as that big yes of going, yeah, I'm in actually. I'm there. I want this. I want to know, uh, you know, more. I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe you're someone here this morning who's been thinking about t- baptism as that step and actually go, no, that's something that, that I want to explore. I don't want to sit on the sidelines anymore. Yeah, I'm in. Maybe uh, a response is more of a kind of a little yes. It's not an all-out shouting, jumping around kind of yes. It's just a little one that kind of says, okay, I'm kind of interested, and I'd like to give this a go, but, but I'm a bit daunted by it. And, and I'm not quite sure about baptism yet and all that sort of thing, so I'm just a little further back. But, but I want to actually, yeah, take a tentative step and begin to try and trust in Jesus. I want to get to know him. Um, and learn about him. Maybe it's more of that healthy maybe. You know, it's not the big jump around, yes. It's not even the kind of the little uh, yes. It's actually going, well, uh, this is intriguing. You know, maybe I'm just kind of, well, I'd like to find out more. Um, I've got questions um, that maybe I don't think you're going to be able to answer, but I'd like to have an opportunity to ask them and to talk them through um, and and see uh, where it might lead. And you know, maybe that's where you might be this morning in one of those uh, spaces. And if that is, then I really want to encourage you, don't leave without talking to someone and sharing that uh, this morning. But the reality is, if we make that choice to follow Jesus, that that will outwork in our lives. That will make a difference in terms of the person we are and what we do. As we go wherever our lives lead us, fulfilling the tasks the opportunities uh, that fall to us. I want to finish with this. I read recently this description of uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. It said, Bach was to classical music what William Shakespeare was to English literature, and Sir Isaac Newton was to physics. Um, They went on to say nearly four centuries after its writing, his piece, Jesus, Joy of Man's Desire, is still ranked one of the most popular soundtracks to one of life's most momentous occasions, the bridal entrance at a wedding ceremony. And Bach apparently, uh, at the end of every composition, he wrote three letters in the margin of the music. S, D, G. Standing for soli deo gloria. To the glory of God alone. And... The, the writer who was reflecting on this, they were saying, you know, they felt that Bach personalised what was at that time, you know, this rallying cry um, for the, the Protestant Reformation, but actually saying, you know, this was his heart. This was what he was about. You know, his life was almost that unique translation of that singular motive, you know, and, and actually that's the challenge that is before every single one of us. Whatever we do, will we seek to do it? To the glory of God. Whether it's sweeping streets, whether it's teaching someone piano, whether it's you know looking after loved ones, whether it's something that we just think oh, actually you know no one's going to think this is important, but actually recognizing that wherever God leads us, whatever we do, we can make a difference for Him. Let me pray. Lord, as we scatter to our front lines, we thank you for the many opportunities to do good in the world today. Whatever the tasks of our week ahead, wherever we are, we pray that you will work through them and that they will bear fruit for your kingdom. May we do all things attentive to your presence and with a heart set on working at them for you first and foremost.